get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Atari, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm excited. We have Cameron Harold. He's a former COO of 1-800-GOT-JUNK. He helped grow the company from $2 million to $106 million in only six years without any debt or outside funding, and he's helped build three $100 million companies. Today, he's a top-rated international speaker. He coaches CEOs on steps to multiply their revenue and profit. And he's the best-selling author of the book, Double Double, How to Double Your Revenue and Profit in Three Years or Less. And it's come out with, I think it's on its seventh printing. Cameron, thanks for joining me. Jeremy, thanks for having me, man. You've done your homework. Appreciate it. A lot of homework. And, you know, because I learn... Every time I watch your, you know, you have amazing TED Talk that people should check out. Um, Let's Raise Kids to Be Entrepreneurs, which we'll talk about and, and much more. But I also want to be, give a big thanks to Michael Rogic for helping make this happen. And I like to start with a fun fact, Cameron, and you have some really interesting fun facts. One is there's a story and an irony behind you being quoted in an accounting book. What's the story behind that? The story is that when I was in school, I realized that I was never going to be the smartest kid in the class, and I had to figure out the shortcuts. I also realized I would never need to get a job. I was always going to work for myself, so I didn't care about my degree because it was never going to help me get a job. So I cheated, Um, and I got someone in second year university to write all my accounting assignments for me. I paid him in beer. And so every week I would get my accounting assignment dropped off, and I would would, uh, pay this guy a case of beers. And at the end of 13... Uh, weeks, I was ready to write my midterm, or my final, I guess, and I realized I was probably going to fail the final I had No idea for any of this accounting. <laughs> and it turns out, yeah, I how'd you get there. around that one? Yeah. Well, I, I got 85% on the test and 17% on the final, so I ended up with about a 52% average, which was my, my whole motto was 5 0 and go. So I, <laughs> I, I got my course, I got my D minus, and off I, off I went. And that was in managerial accounting. About 10 years later, I got a phone call from a woman, and she was working on writing a textbook for managerial accounting, and she wanted to quote me in Chapter 8 on budgeting. And I started laughing and said, ma'am, like, I'd be honored to do this, but I need to tell you something. I cheated in that class. And I told her this entire story, and she laughed and thought it was just too funny to not include it. So the author knew that I cheated in the textbook that she was writing, and um, I wasn't proud of it, but I just thought it was a funny story. It's it's uh, innovative. Let's call it. Well, as, right? my, as my dad said to me, you actually learned how to hire your first accountant. <laughs> right. There. So. so, Cameron, what did you want to be when you grew up? I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I, I knew at a very young age that I wanted to control my time, and uh, my father had actually taken me to a golf course and showed me all these people playing golf in the middle of the day and showed me all the companies that each of them ran. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the day, after we'd played golf for four hours, he showed me all the people coming in that were doctors and dentists and lawyers and accountants and said, they all have jobs and they don't control their time. So I knew at a very young age that being an entrepreneur is how I could control my time. Yeah, You had an interesting job as a caddy and you didn't take the typical route that a caddy did. What did you do? Well, I didn't like the hourly wage idea of, you know, go caddy for four hours and get paid 20 bucks. So I found on the 13th hole of our golf course, it was a very high hill. So I sat at the bottom of the hill in a lawn chair and I would haul people's golf carts up (laughs) and they'd pay me one or two bucks. So after, you know, four hours, I'd made 60 bucks and all my friends caddying for four hours made 20. So I realized that I could um, kind of figure out the system a little bit again. So how did you even think of that? Hey, let's get inside your head for a second. You know that. Well, no, I, I was taught it again at a very young age. I was groomed as an entrepreneur, and I was taught at a young age to spot opportunity, to look for need, and then supply that need. You know, in North America, we have it backwards. We try to invent these great products and then market them to people who don't necessarily need them. What you should do is find a need that exists and then sell into that need. So. Yeah. I just saw people struggling, calling their bag up the hill, and spotted that as an opportunity. I love it. I love it eliminate their pain they'll pay you for that i love it um and your father and grandfather were both entrepreneurs what did they do 
Well, one of my grandfathers was the CEO of a pharmaceutical company, Searle. My other grandfather was the entrepreneur and CEO of a hunting and fishing resort that was very famous back in the 60s and 70s. Nice. And my father started an entrepreneurial um, automotive uh, distributor. He was um, automotive parts to the mines and industry. So what are the big lessons? What did they instill in you when you were younger? Wow. Um, you know, spotting opportunity, taking control of your own destiny, learning how to think on your feet, um, being good in sales, uh, delivering really good value, like really, really, really wowing your customer. Um, I remember my grandfather taught me a lesson one time just about thinking outside of the box. He had a lot of native Indians work for him and when they would get paid, they'd all go out and get drunk and then no one would show up the next morning. So what he did is he paid three of them on Monday, three on Tuesday, three on Wednesday, three on Friday. Like, so none of them ever had enough money to get everybody drunk. And if, if three guys got drunk, he was only short staffed by three. Um, <laughs> oh my just, just thinking outside of the box and being entrepreneurial, but then also really wowing your employees. Like my grandfather's employees loved him. We used to go back to the lodge 20 years after he'd sold it yeah. and they still talked about him. Really? Um, so just really, really taking care of your employees. What did he do with them that made, that you saw that made them love him so much? He gave a shit about them as humans. Yeah. Uh, my dad as well. My dad really cared about them as people, not just their birthday and their dog's name, but you know their fears, their insecurities, their joys, their passions, their their hobbies, their connections with the with their city, and and he just really cared about them as humans. Yeah, and, and he, he demanded a lot from them as well. But I think because they really cared about their employees as people. Um, that's where the, the human connection went to the next level. Yeah. I mean, you have a, a lot of high level CEOs that you coach. Is that instilled in them? Do you have to teach them like caring somewhat or? Um, sometimes, but no, I often, it, it's funny, Guy Kawasaki and I were talking and Guy, I said, you know, how come all of these companies that you touch turn to gold? And he said, I don't touch anything except gold. And I think that's <laughs> kind of true as me. I don't, I don't coach shitty humans. I don't, coach, I don't coach bad companies. I coach very good companies that right. want to continue to grow. I coach great entrepreneurs that want to become better. I coach right. you know, high-performing teams that want to become the best of breed. Yeah. Um, so, you know, but I still have to call some of them on their bullshit. Um, more often than not, I call them on being too nice. I really? call them on, yeah, like I had an entrepreneur the other day who I was coaching, $20 million company, 100 employees, and he just keeps talking about warning this employee. And I said, stop. Like, the, the employee doesn't even believe you anymore. Your warnings are kind of, mm. it's like saying I'm ground you and then not grounding your kid. Right. You need to toughen up. You need to you need to call the ball on this one and really check them. Yeah. Um, so often the entrepreneurs can become so nice that they start believing their own bullshit. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I love, in one of your talks, you talk about uh, the CEO or, or founder of Southwest and what he says about you know what I'm gonna say? Yeah, you, you asked, I asked him. You know, how do you get all your employees to, to smile and to be so happy? And he said, well, we we hire smiley people. Right. You, know, you can't you can't take a grumpy person and make them happy. I was asked by Fortune magazine years ago, how do you motivate your employees? And I said, I don't motivate employees. I hire motivated people. I right. hire people that are already motivated, right. and I inspire them, and then I remove their obstacles and I coach them, but. You don't hold people accountable. You hire accountable people. You don't, you know, you don't make grumpy people happy. Business it, is really, really simple. We just overcomplicate it. I love the exactly. I love your. <laughs> it's simple, but it's it, it makes perfect sense. You know, it's something we overlook. It's just simple. Like yeah. we and as humans, I don't understand some things. Like I was talking to some adults about six weeks ago about about um, baseball and and how we take our kids and send them off to little league and. We teach them how to catch the ball and hold their glove and how to bat and give them all the basics. And we spend hours with our kid getting them ready to go to Little League. But then with all of our employees, we let them go do job interviews or run meetings with no training. Right. Like, how, why would we send, they're going to fail. Why would you let anyone run a meeting if they've never been trained in a meeting? Why would you let anyone do a job interview if they've never been trained in interviewing? So, of course, you end up with crappy employees because you have a crappy process. Why is you that? Because because we we don't think about it like we treat our kids. We treat it. We would never send our kid off to little league without the basic skills because we wouldn't want them to be embarrassed. Right. But we we we're too busy being busy instead of working on the basic skills. You know, no father or mother would ever send their kid into the sport without some of the basics. Well, right. why are we doing it with our employees? Because we overlook it. Yeah. 
And when I think about when I did the research and watched some of the videos um, and talking about the best advice from your dad, I'm not sure if you got it from him or somewhere else, but you talk about R&D. Yeah, the R&D is just... Was I that from him? Was, it is, yeah. I, and and it, was, it was basically that I was never going to be smart enough to figure this out on my own. And my R&D had to stand for rip off and duplicate. Mm -hmm. There's companies out there that have spent millions of dollars putting the best systems in place. You know, I, I helped build a company called College Pro Painters. Yeah. And College Pro is the largest residential house painting company on the planet. And every year they have to go out and hire and train 800 franchisees. And then we had to go out and hire and train 8,000 painters. There's not a lot of companies that hire and train 9,000 people every year. Right. We, we were operationally world class on interviewing. So I just take the systems we always did at College Pro and I teach everybody else the same systems, yeah. you know. Yeah. The leadership systems at GE, I mean, GE spent millions figuring out their leadership systems. Just use those. Right. Why reinvent think, the wheel is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. In a lot of ways, people should stop learning and just start doing more of the stuff that's already been developed. Yeah. What are some of those hiring systems that you found so powerful uh, that co at College Pro Painters? Um, well, one is for hire for attitude and the skill set. So you're looking for both. Yeah. You know, the old adage of hire for attitude, train for skill, that gets you 7% growth. But if you hire someone who's the right culture fit and they've done it before, you win. Um, another one is just really kind of not believing anything the person says in the interview or on their resume and realizing that people embellish or make it up a little bit. So mm -hmm. probe in. Uh, so I use something called Torque, which is the threat of reference check. So I'd be talking to you and I'd be like, so Jeremy, tell me somebody that you worked with that you loved working with. And, you know, what did you love? Blah, blah, blah. Tell me somebody you worked with that you hated working with. What didn't you like? Blah, blah, blah. Over the course of two interviews, we probably have 15 names that you've given me. I'm then going to say, well, by Monday, I need the phone number and email for at least 12 of those 15 people. And if I called Bob and I asked Bob about this core value, when would he tell me you'd broken it? If I called Bob and asked him about number core value number two, when would he tell me you'd broken it? If I called and asked him, and I'd spend 10 minutes asking just what Bob would say about you. Mm. Then I'd say, what happens if I called Kelly? What would she say about number one, number two? number? So I'll do a 90-minute interview just asking you if I asked you each of these people. <clears throat> the A players are going, this is awesome, call anybody. Right. The B players are getting a little bit nervous. The C players are basically crapping themselves <laughs> They don't want you to call anybody. Right. Well, that's a really simple process that involves nothing more than 90 minutes and just asking the same question over and over again. But most entrepreneurs won't spend the time. They'll be too busy checking email and they'll go back and hire a B player. Yeah. So yeah. there's there's finding top talent or there's hiring top talent. There's finding top talent. And you have an interesting methodology for finding top talent. Well, one of them is for finding top talent is you just have to build your brand into a magnet. You really have to build your company into a place that people are magnetized towards. So it's leveraging the press, getting a lot of media about your culture, um, entering all the company awards and contests to become one of the best companies to work for just to become a magnet. But then what we do is we actually have a group interview process. And the group interview is when we bring eight candidates in at the same time, put eight candidates at the one boardroom table, and we have one person from our company interview eight people and all you're looking for is who rises to the top. You know, who's the strongest leader, mm -hmm. strongest culture fit out of that group of eight. And you might find one or two people. And then my last two questions are the key. The second last question is, if we were hiring two people at this table, you, Jeremy, plus somebody else, who else should we hire? Mm. And that's when all of a sudden the strongest people are going to sell you on hiring somebody else at the table. And really, the whole group has just interviewed the group for you. You'll end up with two strong candidates. Mm-hmm. And you talk about, you know, and there's this one talk I watch of you, and you strongly talk about uh, poaching top employees. And you said, everyone in the room, if we are competing, I will get all your top employees from you. So yeah. tell me about that a little bit. Well, it's a, business, is a, business is a war. Business is a, is a battle. I'm not going to – here's the thing. No good employee is out on Craigslist or Monster looking for a job. Right. All the good employees already have a job. They're working somewhere which means if you want them to work for you, you have to go and poach them. Yeah. So you need to kind of pull them into your company. You yeah. need to recruit them to this magnet. They have to have heard about you already. They have to walk in the front door for coffee and go, holy shit, this place is amazing. Right? They're not going to go from a great company to one that is beige. Yeah. Right? But they'll only cross into another great brand. What's your favorite poaching story where you got this amazing employee? 
my favorite poaching story is um, back in around 2005, uh, IntraWest was a Vancouver-based company where I was living at the time. I was running one of them got junk. And IntraWest had just been acquired by Fortress, which is a big hedge fund out of New York. So I knew the culture at IntraWest was going to change. So I phoned the only two people I knew at IntraWest, Graham Kwan and Matt Fraser, and asked them to give me the names of five amazing employees that I could meet for coffee. And I met all five for coffee within about three days and got about another 15 names of people from them. And within about two weeks, we hired six or seven of the mid-level team at um, IntraWest. <laughs> and the rest he was kind of waking up saying, hey, you know, maybe some people will be unemployed in IntraWest. And we're like, yeah, we already got them hired. Oh, my gosh. That's it's great. Like, you have to know where the good people are, right? It's kind yeah. of like dating. If you want to go and find the cute girl, you got to know where the cute girls hang out. Well, you better know that in advance. You don't want to spend all night trying to find where they are. Yeah. So, Cameron, with College Pro Painters, how did you get customers in the early days? In the early days at College Pro, it was a lot of guerrilla marketing. So this was back in the 80s and 90s, late 80s, early 90s. Um, a lot of guerrilla marketing. We realized that, that customers were not tired of our marketing. They, weren't, they didn't need a new flyer or a new piece of copy. They just needed to see us more often. So yeah. we created what we called the Rule of 27. And the Rule of 27 was... A customer needs to see something nine times before they'll take action, but they only see one of every three things you put in front of them. Mm. So if you have three signs up, they're only going to see one of the three, and they need to see something nine times. So it's really nine times three. So we really bombarded people and saturated the marketplace so that people couldn't stop seeing you. What got you into College Pro Painter early on? Um, I was walking through university campus and I saw a flyer on the floor and I picked it up to throw it out and the flyer said, earn $10,000 and run your own business this summer. And I was like, that's for me. Spoke to you. Yeah, that's exactly so I, you. Yeah. I got a franchise of College Pro when I was 20 years old and hired 12 employees and for the next three years I was a franchisee and then I worked for them full time I graduated from school. And there's a unique connection between College Pro Painter, you, Elon Musk and Kimball Musk. There is a very funny, um, funny connection. In 1993, I hired Kimball Musk out of Queen's University to run a franchise, so I hired and trained him. I also hired and trained his cousin, Peter Reeve, who is the CEO of Solar City. Uh, so they both worked for me, and I trained them both. The following year, in 94, end of 94, Kimball called me, and he needed to um, have me as a reference for the very first round of funding that he and his brother Elon were raising for their first company, Zip2. Mm. And they had, they had one employee at the time, and I had to do a reference check with, I think it was Tom Kleiner from Kleiner Perkins. Um, it wasn't even Kleiner Perkins at the time. I think it was still called Kleiner, and it was just a merchant bank. Wow. And uh, they wanted to raise $600,000, and Kimball called me that night. He's like, I have no idea what you told them, but they're giving us $3 million. Wow. Well, they, didn't, they didn't want to back Elon Musk because he just dropped out of Stanford, and he was an unproven brainiac, but they backed Kimball and his college for painters experience, and that was how Zip2 got their first round of funding. Wow. I love that story. Um, yeah. You have had some innovations across your desk. Um, Uber came across your desk seven years ago. What did you think about that seven yeah, years I was, ago? I was at Burning Man, um, and it was, I think, the summer of 2008. And uh, I was at Burning Man, and I was late at night, and I was with Tim Ferriss, who was a very good friend of mine. And Tim was in my camp, and Tim brought a friend of Garrett to our camp that day. Garrett was staying with us as well. And Garrett was the founder of Uber, which I was on. Like, Garrett was the first CEO. And uh, he was pitching me on, on Uber and what the concept was, and I thought it was the craziest idea I'd ever heard of. Uh, I thought there's no way he'd be able to pull it off. So I'm not very good at identifying a good idea, <laughs> but, but if you want me to help you build it, I can help you build it. I just can't tell you if it's good or not. What was the early vision for Uber? What did he tell you at the time? Well, you got to remember back in 2008, he was trying to explain what an app was and how you were using a phone with an app. Well, the app story wasn't even launched yet, so... Mm -hmm. That concept was still very foreign. That's amazing. Um, we didn't understand how crowdsourcing and crowd sharing really hadn't started yet. So how are you going to get all these limousines to even be available? And what if you called and there wasn't one there? And, and it, the whole concept just didn't make a whole lot of sense. Yeah. Um, plus, plus, his first company stumbled upon was just completely bizarre. Like, why would you keep stumbling on more websites just because <laughs> you're doing life? So that uh, just seemed like a completely crazy He's idea. A what they did, Yeah. 
what he did that was amazing was he actually bought the supply side. So they raised money and then paid limo drivers $300 a day to sit and just be available in case someone booked them. Really? So no matter where they booked, there was a limo driver waiting, Wow! even if only did one fare. So they bought the supply side up, and that was really their critical first step. Wow. And so what got you into Burning Man? Um, Burning Man, I had three different friends back in 2007. I've been five times, uh, but three different friends called me up and we're going and I was kind of captivated by some of the art that I'd seen online and um, just wanted to go out and do it and it's been an amazing experience I love it there so what's the craziest thing you've experienced that was impactful to you at Burning Man craziest thing that was impactful to me um, probably just having some conversations with people and realizing that we didn't care what each other did for work. We didn't care what we did to make money. Um, we, in fact, never really talked about work, but we just explored ideas and talked about concepts and talked about fears. And, and I realized that I wasn't judging anyone based on what they did anymore. I was just having these amazing discussions with humans. Mm -hmm. And I stopped judging people based on what they looked like or what their job was or mm. what their title was. Um, I also started hugging everyone. Really? I don't, I don't shake hands anymore. I, I would rather hug someone. Oh, wow. Eat. I, when I met the CEO of Sprint for the first time, um, I gave a hug. And I actually coach um, the CEO of Sprint right now. I'm his second in command. So, But yeah, it's just, you know, uh, Burning Man broke down a lot of my barriers, a lot of my boundaries. I think that could be the title of your next book, Hug or something. Uh, <laughs> um one of the guys that I go to Burning Man with every year, his nickname is Hugs, because he does about a thousand hugs while he's there. Really? Yeah, he runs around chasing people, trying to give them hugs. It's <laughs> pretty hilarious. What was it about Burning Man that made you start hugging? Um, well, everyone hugs there. It's, oh. uh, yeah, there, it is a bit of a hugging it's kind a culture. of community. Yeah, it's just part of the culture of, of um, humanity and connection, and um, this is just so formal. And... Life isn't supposed to be formal. Life yeah. is supposed to be relaxed and more fun. Yeah, yeah. So I want to talk about 1-800-GOT-JUNK too, but um, but I want to find a lesson from you, Barter, because you did the College Pro Painter and then you, Barter.com, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, you, com was a, a really interesting concept. It was a private currency uh, back in the late 90s, and we sold in January of 2000, sold the company. But it was, we had 30,000 companies buying and selling using our currency instead of wow. the U.S. dollar. So we created an electronic debit and credit. Was it like early Bitcoin? Like what would you compare it to? It was very, like very early Bitcoin. So yeah. we created the currency. Um, we loaned out the currency to businesses. They would buy it. We had Starwood Hotels and Avis Rent-A-Car, Hard Rock Cafe, Overstock.com. Like we had some big brands that were using our currency. Yeah. Um, and then we had very small, like, mom and pop restaurants and bars and printers. And, uh, but the idea was to, to facilitate barter that wouldn't normally happen. Um, so we facilitated this multilateral trade. Well, I guess the big lessons that came out of, of you barter um, was understanding companies' variable costs and understanding how you could continue to barter in your growth. So I had a client years ago who paid me to coach him and he paid me in Bordeaux and Burgundies. Uh, paid me in every month. I would get either three cases or one case of wine, and I got to decide. And they'd either be very expensive bottles in the one case or my house wine in my three cases. And I realized for him it was good because he was buying my time at half of his normal cost. Right. For me it was good because I was just trading a couple hours and getting you know three thousand dollars worth of wine. Yeah. So you think it made you think out of the box and exchanges and that kind of thing? made me see exchanges and it made me understand how to negotiate. Like if I go to a hotel now, I recognize that the cost of a hotel room is really only like $15 a night. It only costs them $15 because of the shampoo and the soap and the maid to clean the room. Outside of that, on any given day, if that hotel room does not rent, they can't rent it again. Right. It's not like a, a water bottle that if I don't sell it today, I can sell it tomorrow. It's right. expired. It's gone. Inventory. Yeah. So I started to see things in a different way and understand negotiating. I, I negotiate very differently for advertising now because I realize that it's air. 
you know, or a magazine ad is just a piece of paper. There's no, so the fact that they want to charge me $10,000 for an ad is ludicrous when I know it costs them nothing. So the day before they go to print, I'll just say, I'll give you a thousand for a half a page. If they have it, they're going to give it to me. If they don't, they won't. Right. But tomorrow, as soon as it goes to print, they can never sell that half it's page. gone. Again. Yeah. Trade show, trade show space. You know, if you're going to a trade show, don't pre-buy your booth three months in advance. Buy it the week before because your price is going to drop. Um, yeah, yeah. So then what got you started at 1-800-GOT-JUNK? Well, it was one of my best friends at the time who was uh, building the business. And um, he'd been in a forum with me in EO for years, the Entrepreneurs Organization. And he asked me if I would start coaching him. I said I would coach him for about three months. Um, and six and a half years later, I left. There was just too much to do. So we, I was the chief operating officer, and we built it from 14 employees. In when I got there, I was the 14th employee at the head office. And when I left, we had around 3,000 employees system-wide. Wow. And it wasn't called 1-800-GOT-JUNK early on. Yeah, it was called the Rubbish Boys originally. Rubbish and, Boys. Um, Rubbish boys. And the word rubbish didn't really translate into the U.S. market as well. Rubbish is a British term. So we uh, changed the name over to 1-800-GOT-JUNK. We followed the, the rules of um, Al Reese, who wrote 22 you know, the Laws of Marketing. Yeah. And we literally created a category and branded the category. We made our, our name a call to action, like 1-800-GOT-JUNK, and off we went. And you know what's interesting is you talk about um, what you learned from an Olympic coach. Um, and now there was painted picture you talk about in your talks and now you, you call it the vivid vision. Tell people a little bit about the, what was the vivid vision at 1-800-GOT-JUNK? Well, the, the, and the concept that I learned from this Olympic coach was that high performance athletes will visualize themselves performing the event. They'll close their eyes and see themselves over and over and over again performing so that when they're performing, they could almost do it completely on instinct. And they said that if a business owner could see their business in the future, like three years from now, and communicate what they see to all their employees so everyone can see the same thing, they could then work towards creating that thing. Right. Uh, so I, that's where this concept of the vivid vision came from, was a, a three or a four page document that describes your company in the future. So we use that, that concept at 1-800-GOT-JUNK and I've been teaching it to companies all over the world for years. Yeah, and there's there's so many really amazing stories that came out of that vivid vision from 1-800-GOT-JUNK and one that sticks out is the one from Starbucks. Sure. So we created, um, from the vivid vision, we created what we called our Can You Imagine wall. And we put a big wall up in the office where we got employees to put ideas that they could imagine up mm. on the wall. So one of them was a girl, Andrea Baxter, who was in our marketing group, and she had the idea of uh, 1-800-GOT-JUNK on the side of Starbucks cups. So back in around 2003, Starbucks had a campaign called The Way I See It, and they had quotes from famous people on their Starbucks cups. Well, we put it up on the wall, and Andrea started contacting her marketing department, and a couple of weeks later, she got approval. But they didn't want to put 1-800-GOT-JUNK down. They just wanted to have Brian's name as the CEO and just say entrepreneur. And we went back to them and said, you know what, we showed the picture of the wall where it said 1-800-GOT-JUNK on the sides of Starbucks cups. And Howard signed off on it. We were the first <laughs> brand to have their company name on Starbucks cups North America wide. I think we were on about 10 million cups. Wow. For free. That's amazing. I love that rebuttal. It's like, but it's on our board. Like you have to put it on there, right? It won't be true if the vision doesn't get completed, right? So what? Yeah, the number. The yeah. number of those stories is astounding. Like, you know, being covered by Harvard is a base a case study. And um, anyway, yeah, the stories went on. I think you got an Oprah, right? Yeah, we were on Oprah. We, were, we had a seven minute piece on Oprah. We were on Dr. Phil 17 or 18 times. Um, wow. Pretty much any major news outlet covered us. So, what's on your, your um, vivid vision now? What's on mind right now is I actually want to replace vision statements worldwide with vivid visions. Okay. The idea is that businesses are using a vision statement or a mission statement and it doesn't do anything. It doesn't align the employees and the suppliers and the customers. People are still guessing. So I really want to have that as a concept completely replace vision statements. And, and so that's really my big hack is pushing towards that. How can we start? How can someone start now creating their vivid vision uh, according to well, what you think should be proper? Yeah, in, in chapter one of my book, Double Double, it outlines um, exactly what a 
division is. So they can either, you know, grab the book off Amazon or iTunes, or I can email them the chapter from my book, Double Double, if they just want the one chapter. But if they read that and then start writing theirs, it's a very simple process. I outline it really clearly as to how to get what's in your mind out and then articulate it in such a way that it inspires everyone else. Yeah, or Audible is great. Um, the So with the vivid vision, Cameron, what's the biggest mistake people make in when they do this? One of them is that they don't follow the rule of three years and that they lean too far out into the future. You know, they do a 10-year or a 20-year, and that's too far out. It's too far out there that people can't really wrap their head around it. Um, or they get too specific and they put a lot of numbers in. So this is not a plan. It's very similar to a homeowner who wants to design their dream home. It's lots of pictures and sketches and drawings. You know, and if you wrote down what you saw, that would be the vivid vision. And then you would create the blueprints and the plans to make that come true. Yeah. So this isn't, the, this isn't the plan as to how to make the future come true. It's almost as if you're standing in your company December 31st, three years from now, looking around your company and you describe what you can see. Right. You know, and then what you did with 1-800-GOT-JUNK um, is truly amazing. And you are forming or form the COO Alliance. So I want you to talk a little bit about that. Sure. So I've, I've been the second in command a few times with companies. And then I've also coached so many entrepreneurs over the years yeah. that what I identified was everyone is working and teaching the CEO, but then the CEO doesn't really know how to put it all in place. And the missing gap is really their COO, their second in command, right. who really has to actually make the entrepreneur's dreams come true. So I started this COO alliance where we meet three to four times a year mm. in Scottsdale and these COOs come in together and we work together on growing our skill set, masterminding together. But it's all around the intricacies of being that second in command and how to make the CEO iconic. And then once a year, we allow the CEO to come into our group. Um, but the rest of the time, it is. And then you get a paintball seconds. gun and you shoot them. No. We just, it's just a really bizarre relationship. So um, that's not a bad idea. I might take you up on that one. <laughs> so then this is really for top high level COOs, right? Well, it's for it's for the, the first two groups that I'm putting on um, in May. Uh, the youngest is around 27 years old, the oldest is 62. The smallest company is around $3 million. The biggest is around $300 million. Yeah. The smallest has about 25 employees. The biggest has 900 employees. So it's really, it's not the COOs of the Fortune 100s. It's more the COOs of the million to $100 million or the $2 million to $200 million companies. Yeah. And I know, you know, Cameron, you talk about also the vivid vision will attract people and it will repel people, right? So I'm curious... Who do you attract and repel with your, your vivid vision right now? Sure. So I, I really do attract the entrepreneurial people and entrepreneurial companies. Yeah. Um, I think the companies that I don't resonate with are ones that are very corporate, very staid, very, you know, mm -hmm. MBA, mm -hmm. um, that I, I'm too entrepreneurial for them, that I'm too much on these, these shortcuts or simple, easy, you know, to, to execute systems. Um, but I work very well with the young, fun, entrepreneurial, high viral, high growth companies. Mm -hmm. um, interesting, like that I'm coaching, you know, the top team at Sprint, that they're trying to become more entrepreneurial. They're trying to do one of the biggest turnarounds in American history. Um, you know, whether they pull it off or not remains to be seen. But I'll tell you, they're certainly giving it everything they got. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to break all the corporate rules and just become more like an entrepreneurial company. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I know, you know, for – it's hard to encapsulate – the experience and some of the key thing takeaways from 1-800 got junk, but I know there's a lot of cool war stories from that era. What are some memorable war stories that, that are still on your, one of your battle scars from 1-800 got junk? I think, I think one is definitely that, um, Brian and I, Brian, the CEO and myself as the CEO, were very dominant, very expressive, very, very drivers, big quick starts. And, um, we didn't often listen to the quieter, analytical, amiable people who mm. maybe were trying to slow us down or have us be a little bit more cautious. Yeah. Um, and I remember one day that the VP of Finance kept cautioning us on our financial decisions and, and some of our decisions on spending, and uh, we just bowled right over him. And then, sure enough, he was right. You know, mm. we, we spent a few million dollars in cash. What we should have done was gone to the bank to get financing, but we didn't understand you know, that, that component of our business at the time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think it's just really 
slowing down and listening and um, putting systems in place so that we truly did listen more than we talked. Yeah. And you do seem to, seem to be very like self-reflective. Like I noticed on your about page, I think it's your about page, you list your Colby profile score. You talk a lot about your unique ability um, that you learned from strategic coach. Um, yeah. wh- what is your unique ability and how did you actually sit down and actually come up with it's I would think it's hard to come up with what your unique ability is well it's interesting it is from strategic coach in fact I was at strategic coach yesterday I go mm. every year Dan Sullivan's 10x program which I'm in his top tier program yeah um, so I go every quarter to continually build my skills and continue to learn um, the way I came up with it was years ago where I surrounded myself with a number of people who knew me really well mm-hmm. and I got them to describe what I was really good at and it kind of all percolated to the surface that mm-hmm. I use quick intuitive alternatives to reverse engineer entrepreneurs' dreams. And mm-hmm. uh, that's basically what I do is I, I can't, it's why I can't really systemize myself as a coach and a mentor is you can't replicate me. Right. It's, it's, and that's why I'm paid when I'm paid by some of these great companies is because I'm just really, really good at it. Um, and I, uh, yeah, you can't, it's, it's not a system. It's, it's a really, it's understanding. It's a unique the, ability, right? Yeah. And I understand the organism of a business. I understand what's happening and then I can kind of plug my ideas in. And then if I don't know, I just say, I don't know. Yeah. Like yeah. I, I'm not embarrassed to say I don't know because I spent half my life doing it in school. Yeah. And you've helped a lot of companies, um, CEOs with big breakthroughs. And one thing that sticks out when I was reading, um, Metacomp, what they said was really interesting. Um, where they talked about you delivering fantastic structured systems and then they talked about the huge growth they had. So it makes me think, well, what, like, what's an example of a system you went in and you're like, that created some explosive growth for them? Sure. So I'll think back on Metacomp. Um, well, one of the ones on Metacomp was the systems related to culture and um, breaking down all of their walls and all of their doors and opening up their entire office space. Literally. So that Literally, oh, wow. so that everyone sat with everyone and um, creating a complete open office environment. Mm. And they weren't used to it. They were very closed, you know, 20 private offices with 50 other employees and very much an us and them. And um, so just putting the system in place to really create alignment and, you know, any of the walls became glass. There were no doors on meeting mm. rooms. There were blinds on the doors or walls. Um just kind of opening it up so that the CEO was connected with everybody else and everyone was connected with everyone. Interesting. So what's another cool thing you went in and did well, with the company like that? At, at Metacomp? Um, I mean, it doesn't have to be with Metacomp. It could be with anyone. Well, yeah. I can give you another one with them was yeah. um, just realizing that when you put a job post up to attract an employee, it should be like a marketing ad. It should be like an advertisement, which means it can't be boring. And most job ads are boring. So these guys are a fun company. They wear shorts and flip flops to work, and you know their their um, cardiac heart monitor equipment is on the space station. Uh, but they didn't want to have a boring VP of engineering. They wanted somebody who was fun that they could have beer with and hang out. So they posted this job posting that was crazy. I mean, it was insane. It was funny, and and originally they were all a little bit nervous because they're like, "Whoa, we can't do that. We're too professional." But then they went, "Wait a second, we're not professional at all." And what they got was this engineer who's just funny and quirky and awesome and extraordinarily talented as an engineer, but he really fit culturally. And now all of their job postings are like, you know, marketing ads. They're mm. just fun. Let the job postings kind of reflect the personality of the company. Yeah, and if your personality is beige, you're not attracting anybody. Yeah. yeah right? Yeah. You got you gotta decide what that culture's gonna be. Yeah. You talked about Double Double, and I encourage anyone, it's fantastic, um, on Audible, or, or you can buy the book, I prefer Audible. Um, one of my favorite stories from the book is with the note cards. Do you still do that, um, writing down the, the tasks? So, I mean, because I read your book, I listened to your book, I actually do that, and I yeah. actually list it out. So, so the, the idea is that at the end of every day, you write down the top five things that you want to do tomorrow, yeah. and then you put those things in the order of impact, one through five, and then first thing in the morning, you start working on item one. So I use an app that's called mm. Commit to Three. I got you. And, and Commit to Three now is, is where I write down my top three business goals, and, and actually, I commit my top three business goals every day 
to a guy named Joe Polish, and Joe commits his top three back to me. Mm. And then I commit my top three personal goals of the day to a friend, Gordy Buffton, and Gordy commits his personal top three back to me. So you have that accountability so, too. Yeah, so t- today my top three are to read for 30 minutes to go for a run and get a haircut, and my top three business goals are to finish the CEO Alliance agenda, to get a sticker order for the CEO Alliance, and... Uh, to clean out the um, my end of the week um, email from last week because I didn't get to it on the weekend. Nice. <clears throat> so that's it. That's those, and those are in, in order. So you have some books coming up you're working on. Yeah, I'm working on three. God, you've done your research. Um, so I'm working on three books with a group called Book in a Box. And oh, okay, cool. Advisor. With Tucker. Okay, Tucker. Yeah. I'm, so I'm one of Tucker's advisors. I'm an advisor to his company. And... Um, in fact, his COO is coming to my CEO Alliance in May as well. But That's fitting, books. right? Yeah. Yeah, it's perfect. I'm working on three books with them. One is called Meetings Suck, and it's basically about the fact that meetings actually don't suck. We just suck at running meetings. Right. Uh, the second one is around vivid visions, and then the third is around how to generate fruit for us and how to get more publicity for your business. So the Meetings book actually comes out this week. And oh, cool. Congratulations. Thank you, yeah. And then uh, the Vision one will come out in around three months, and the PR one will come out in around five months. That's awesome. Okay. We'll have to link those up in the actual uh, post, too, um, when it goes live. Um, So I can't leave this uh, interview, obviously, without talking about raising entrepreneurs, right? So you have this great TED Talk. You know, everyone should watch it. I think it was top 200 watch TED Talks of all time. Um, What did you do to help raise your kids to be entrepreneurs that we should also also do? I mean, I have a you know a two and a four year old, so tell me what should I be doing? Well, it's interesting. So, so my TED talk was actually about how I was raised as an entrepreneur, right. less about what I'm doing. So, yeah. um, but things like um, really working to build their confidence, yeah. um, working to build their speaking skills, so they're comfortable speaking in front of people teaching them to save half of the money that they ever earned so that, you know, they're, they're good at saving money as well as making money. Yeah. Um, teaching them to spot opportunities, teaching them to negotiate. So I won't give my kids an allowance, but if they spot things around the home that have to get done, we can negotiate on how much they want to get paid to do them. Right. And I end up saying, hey, I need you to do this. They don't get paid at all. But if they spot the opportunity and negotiate on it, so teaching them those kinds of things. Yeah, yeah. And like you said, Cameron, you know, being an entrepreneur – in business is simple, it's not necessarily easy. Um, what's been the lowest point and how you push through the tough times? Well, the lowest point probably for me was in um, August or September and I completely fell apart. I, um, I had a complete and utter totally nervous breakdown. One of my VPs tapped me on the shoulder and asked me if I was okay, and I collapsed on the floor of the elevator, sobbing, wow. and, and said, um, yeah, I'm okay. I went to a doctor about a week later and went for a physical, and I ended up having nine of the ten most stressful events happening simultaneously. You, my, my, you said something, I remember, about a metallic taste. What, yeah, what? so there was this metallic taste at the back of my neck. It almost was like I was chewing on tin foil or chewing on aluminum foil. Yeah, what was that? Into, it was a chemical secretion that's caused by stress. Really? And it turned out I was clinically redlining. Holy I was cow. Literally, literally on the edge. And um, so I, I changed stuff. I dropped 40 pounds and I stopped drinking constantly and I started getting more exercise and I started recognizing the signals of stress and trying to eliminate those. So was that just a wake up call for you? Like, what do you. It sounds um, it was, like a really hard time to just turn that, the, all that stuff around. Yeah, what was not, the wake-up call actually wasn't sobbing in the elevator. It was then being told by a doctor that the metallic taste was from stress. Mm. And I went, holy shit, like I'm only 35 years old and I'm clinically redlining. That's a scary place to be. Yeah. You know, a really scary place to be. So how would you change some of those habits? Because that's not so easy. You've been doing this, selling coat hangers, comic books since you were young. So it's like, how do you just turn, turn that off or turn it around? You start to, you start, I started to realize the symptoms and I would start to find myself in these patterns and I would recognize them. It's almost like I was having these out-of-body experiences and I would, I would watch myself or I would feel the metallic taste again or I would realize that I was manic. And so I'm, I became more introspective and intuitive 
um, an emotionally intelligent with my roller coaster ride of, of the entrepreneur. I actually talk about the highs and lows of CEOs in the book. Yeah. And I just I became more emotionally intelligent with that. So when that happens now, what do you like you feel that warning sign? What do you do? It's funny because that's how Kim Ferris and I actually met was she saw me do a speaking event around ten years ago about the highs and lows of CEOs, mm-hmm. asked me to write a guest blog about it. What I do now is I, I de stress. I go for a run, I go for a massage, yeah. I I'm disconnected five o'clock. I don't work at night. Um, I realize that we're never going to get it all done. You know, we're never going to get our to-do list completed because we'll add more to our list tomorrow anyway. It's a bit of a lie trying to work, 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 work. And um, there's just a lot more things to be engaged in. So it's having hobbies and wanting to spend time with friends and family and enjoying the disconnects as much as I enjoy working. Yeah. So what is your hobby that you, that helps you get disconnected? Yeah, I love golfing, love hiking, spending time with my kids, um, love cooking, love being around friends, love going to, you know, just other events, but hiking, tennis, skiing, um, just came back from Whistler, a couple of days of Whistler. Nice. So on the flip side, Cameron, from the low point, what's been one of the proudest moments for you? Um, I think the proudest moments is probably that I really control my time. You know, I've gone to 21 countries in the last five years with my wife. Um, I've taken about eight to ten weeks vacation every year with the kids and my wife. Um, that I'm really have built something that has given me the life that I've always wanted. Um, it used to be, you know, press that I've landed or success or milestones. And I think now it's about the fact that Big I've experiences. Lived, I've created experiences and I've created yeah. the time. What was one of those travels that you just pinched yourself that you realized? that you, you have that luxury of, of doing what you do and traveling in, in the time? Um, well, there were two. One was in January of this year. I was over in Qatar, and I was coaching the sheik who runs the country, owns the country. Really? Uh, so that was <laughs> That's <one>. amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, I coach a monarchy. and then I uh, read that in your site, and I meant to ask. Yeah, I'm like, what does that mean, you coach a monarchy? Yeah. So, yeah, it's an absolute monarchy, the only country. Wow. And then, um, but the last summer, my wife and girls and I went to Europe for um, three weeks, and we did, you know, a week in Amsterdam and a week in France and a week in London and a week in Barcelona. I guess we were there for four weeks and just completely disconnected. Um, you know, it didn't didn't work and just got to travel and enjoy and live. So those kinds of trips, I think, are pretty amazing. That's absolutely amazing. Um, Cameron, what are some of the daily rituals that you think are most important that other people should think about employing for themselves also? Well, one is definitely the, the top five idea. You yeah. Know, setting your daily goals so yeah. that you work with critical few things versus the important many. Yeah. Um, just taking the time to de-stress on that daily basis to have the ritual of stopping work. Um, you know, you can't work nights, you can't work weekends. Yeah. Um, uh, having daily ritual of disconnecting and doing something fun, whether it's going for a run or reading a book or spending time with your yeah. friends or family. Yeah. I mean, I don't do enough meditation. I just did finish doing a course in transcendental meditation, mm. but um, meditation and yoga are certainly great for balancing and, and disconnecting it. Yeah. Cameron, I just want to thank you. This has been fantastic. Uh, where should we point people towards to make sure they check out online? Yeah, if they go to CameronHerald.com, and it's H-E-R-O-L-D.com, or like you mentioned on Amazon or iTunes or Audible, they can get copies of Double Double or Meetings Suck. Um, that would be great. Check out CameronHerald.com, Double Double, fantastic on Audible or Amazon. Cameron, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Jeremy, it was fun. This is a great interview. I really appreciate the time yeah, today. Thank you. Come on. See ya. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See, life's like a beach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand